tonight? Good. All right, well, hey, my name's Dustin. I'm the youth pastor here. I went on a trip. I had lost some weight, got better looking, and now I'm here to preach to you guys. So, no, not really. I'm not Dustin. But uh, my name's Kit Carroll. I'm one of the guys on staff up here. Uh, I recognize a lot of you guys. We uh, are having a loud mic right here. Um, sorry about that. We, uh, I was here with you guys a couple months ago, right before Christmas, and we talked about God's heart to reach all peoples over the earth and reach people that look different, and we talked about that, and, and we talked about sharing our faith with our neighbors. That's the last time I got to be with you guys, and I know right now we're in this series called God Is, and I don't know if this is your first night here. If it is, we're glad you're here, but the last two weeks we're in this series called God Is, and, and then fill in the blank, and we've done God Is Real, and we've done God Is Holy. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the fact that God is in control, and, and that's a... Uh, that, that carries a lot of weight with it, kind of depending on where you're coming from. And, and so for the, for the non-Christian, when I say God is in control, that might be like, yeah, whatever, I don't even believe in God, so how is He in control? Uh, was he, what's He in control of my life, the world, every little detail, some of the details, uh, just the big picture stuff, who I marry, who I'm in a day, who's going to prom with me, like, what is God in control of? And, and for the Christian in here, we don't want to assume that because we trust in Jesus and we know who God is and we have a relationship with Him, we don't want to trust the fact that we just always believe He's in control because anybody who's walked with God for any period of time is come to this realization where they're like, I don't know if God is in control. And so we have to look to the Scriptures and we have to look to what God says about that to see that. And the other side of that is we just have to, to, to live life and so when we talk to students about the fact that God is in control, a lot of that is connected to just seeing God work over a longer period of time. I mean, I obviously know from my obvious years and years of living on this earth in wisdom, so I'm not speaking from just too much experience, but I have walked with God for a while now and seen how this works. So, so that's what I want to talk to you, to, you tonight, to you tonight about. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, that's where we're going to be tonight. Ephesians chapter 1. I would encourage you, if you have the Bible app, uh, pull that up. If, if you're in here and you didn't bring a Bible and you don't uh, want to listen to this or, or not, I would encourage you, even as we speak, download the Bible app, look it up, and, and just and just give me the next 15, 20 minutes to, to see what God says, or if there is if this if there is this God who's real and holy, as we've talked about, what is he what is he in control of? And, and so we're gonna look at that tonight. Um, but before we do, um, how many of you in here just by show of hands, have ever felt like your life is out of control? Everybody? Yeah. Yeah, me too. And I can think of several times when I was very aware of my life being out of control before I was a Christian, when I was doing crazy stuff, and 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 I won't go, go into all the crazy stuff I was doing, but I, I remember coming to a place thinking, my life is way out of control. Um, but more times than not, I remember being a follower of Jesus Having come to know Jesus in a youth group setting just like this and, and walking with God and then thinking, wait, I'm following Jesus. How is God in control of my life? I'm doing the God stuff. I'm following what he said to do and everything is out of control. And I hit that point my freshman year of college. So I graduated high school and I was going to go to one big university and I had this whole plan for my life. I thought, I know God's plan. I know, you know. I know he's in control, but I have a really good idea about what that is he's telling me to do. And so I was going to go to one school. And then I went to youth camp, which was a lot like city camp. So if you're not going to camp, you need to go to camp because God will change your life. It's probably not good, as I'm about to tell you how I didn't feel like God was in control after that. But there was a reality that I went to camp and I changed. I went to this other college. And how many in here know what a potluck roommate is? Yeah? Well, if you don't know, a potluck roommate is when you go off to college and you're going to live in the dorm. And you get stuck with whoever they put in there. And so a potluck means you just you just get what you get. And so I got a potluck roommate. So I had, I never met the guy until I showed up uh, in my room. And it's like, I guess we're, we're roommates for the next, you know, however, however long this is going to be in this in this space. And, and dorms are tiny. They're little rooms and two people live in them. And guys' dorms are usually smelly and it can be rough. And uh, how many of you guys have a really annoying little brother or little sister? Yeah? How many of them are in this room? Yeah? Some of them? Okay. Well, that's, we'll, we'll deal with that in small groups and let you work through those issues. But um, this guy that I got rooming with, 
was like the worst little annoying brother or sister ever. And it started off as little things, little shenanigans here and there, but it got to be a real problem. It made my living situation really rough. He was nocturnal, so he slept in the day, and he, he didn't sleep at night, so I'm trying to get rest, and, and, and he's out doing all sorts of things. We, in a very real way, out of my, out of my dorm room, which I hosted Bible studies in one night, we had a, I found out later, a prescription drug business coming out of our room. We, I, I, true, these are all true stories. And one night I, I walked into my room and the floor was on fire in a smiley face. He, he, he had taken, and I, I swear these are true, there's witnesses. He had taken hand sanitizer. Y'all can do this at home, so don't do this. But he had taken hand sanitizer and there was just a smiley face from hell coming up out of my floor. And, and I was like, I mean, right next to my clothes, my open drawers and, and all that. But it kind of culminated. Um, so all the time this is going on, it's funny now, and some of it was funny then, but it was really tough. And I'm like trying to, there's a, there's a guy across the hall from me that I was becoming good friends with. He was on the soccer team, I was on the basketball team at the university, we were playing sports, and we become really close, but he hated God. He felt like God was not in control. He was anti-Christian, he made fun of all the Christians on campus. I think I was the only Christian he would give the time of day to. And that's not because I'm special, that's just because we live together and we, we dealt with my roommate. But it kind of culminated one night, so I've been trying to share Jesus with my buddy Marcos across the hall. And my roommate, we'll call him Aaron, just save his name for in case this ever gets out on the web or anything. But Aaron, uh, one day, I, I, it kind of, you know when something builds in you and builds in you and then you finally snap? That ever happened? Well, one day, I'm walking back to, from practice to my dorm room, and I get to the door. And on the wall, of, or I mean on my door was a, just a piece of notebook paper, and he wrote on it, and I, I kid you not, this is word for word, it said, Kent, dot, dot, dot. Its name is Reginald. I know what I'm doing, I'll be back in five. So a couple things are going through my mind at this point. What's name is Reginald? Why is it named Reginald? You never know what you're doing. And like, should I like go get like animal control? Is this like that? Is this like one of those things I'm gonna turn open the door and there's gonna be a, a line behind it? I mean, I didn't know what was going on, and uh, God did. If God is in control. That's the thing that's tonight. But um, I opened the door, and in my dirty clothes hamper, with my clothes thrown everywhere, was a uh, a live dove sitting in a bowl of water because it was dehydrated. So I guess I had to soak up the water. And so I kind of have, you know, the, you know the Home Alone movies that come on at Christmas uh, from the 90s and there's that, that part where she yells Kevin really loud? That, I had that moment. I was like, Aaron! Why is there? And then I just, you know, prayed for him and, and said that, you know, that was it because I was a Christian. I was sharing the gospel with my friends. And so, but it was this moment and, and he came in and he's all, ha, 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 ha. Like Matt knew, ha, ha, ha. And, and so I grabbed I'm just kidding, Matt. I grabbed, I talk Matt every time I get up here. I grabbed Aaron, and I was, I was ticked. It was just, it had been a bad day. It was like that snapping point. And I shoved him against the wall in front of half of my dorm mates that were all here, who I've been trying to share Jesus with and show them the love of Christ. And they've never seen me get mad. And, and I shoved him against the wall, and I'm like, you're getting rid of this bird, and you're buying me a new box of cereal. That's another story. And I'm done with this. And I remember literally, I went and spent the night in a buddy's room, and I remember literally praying and just being like, my life is terrible right now. And God, I followed you to this place, I'm doing your will, and you are not in control. This is, there's blind animals in my room. And I was very frustrated. And then, you know, it's, and so there's moments when you have those moments where you're like, God was in control. I had another very real, a lot more serious moment two years later, um, I had a week that was the roughest week of my life. And I, it was funny because it was just coming off of a spiritual high. I got to teach at this youth student thing. And, and I was real excited. Like, hey, I got to preach. This is cool. I'm following God's will. Kind of same thing. And on my way back into town from, from driving to do that, I get a call. One of my buddies got hit on his bicycle. He was riding long distance on the side of the highway. He got hit. He got airlifted to Lubbock. And, and he died. And I'm, nine, and I'm 19, 20 years old, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh. I, I never experienced that. I know many in this room, you guys have experienced somebody close to your age dying. Many haven't, but 
the longer you live, that, that'll happen. So we, we, we Aaron dies, it's a different Aaron. Um, he dies and I do his funeral on Thursday. I just go to it, I don't know, like speaking of anything. I just go to his funeral Thursday and that night I go to a small group and I get a call in the middle of a small group and another one of our close friends died. And so in a week, two friends died. And that was a whole nother level of God is not in control. I just went from one week earlier telling students, just like in this room, how God is in control. And I'm a Christian and I'm teaching students. I'm saying, God is in control, guys. Trust Jesus with your life. And then the next week, four or five days later, I've had two friends die. And I'm like, is God in control? How is he in control? And so you're going to have moments like that. Some of you guys are in those situations right now in this room tonight. And there is stuff going on in your life with your families, with your friends, on different levels that there's a lot of questions of of is God in control and, and how and how is He? And so when you come to those places as a Christian, and I would encourage you that that don't profess Christ, that don't know who Jesus is, you look to the Bible to try to find those answers. That's what we always want to do at Siggy and at Stony. We want to point you to where you can find answers and find out what God has to say about this kind of stuff. And so a great passage for that is in um, Ephesians chapter one. Read with me in verse seven through eleven. It says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. He has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us His mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill His own good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for He chose us in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His plan. Okay, so let's, let's walk through um, a couple parts of that. First of all, uh, verse 7 and 9, it says He's rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom uh, with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. That's the gospel. So if you don't know Jesus, if you, if you don't know what it's like to have a relationship with Christ, that's how you come to know Him. You, you accept the fact that that Jesus died for you, that He loves you, that He purchased freedom for your life, freedom from sin, freedom from your circumstances, freedom from um, just a, a life in, in, in slavery to a life in freedom. And He does that through the Christ and through the blood. Um, and that's, and that's kind of what He did. That's the gospel message. But then He says in verse 8 that He has showered His kindness on us. So He's talking to Christians. So what He's saying is, for those of you that have been purchased by the blood... You can understand. He says he has showered us his, with his kindness on us and he gave us wisdom and understanding. So he's saying, Christian, if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, then you can, a part of that, one of the gifts God gives you in that is wisdom and understanding. So when you have those moments in your life where you're like, how is God in control? You can, you can have understanding. You can know how. Because the, the reality is, is that God being in control is better than you being in control. But you can only see that in time as your relationship grows with Him. So you've got to have that relationship first. But then once you have that, He, he promised us to give to gives us wisdom and understanding in those situations as believers. Um, not only does He promise to give us that, but He says in verse 9 that God has now revealed to us this mysterious plan. So He's, he's telling us what this whole, how am I following Jesus with stuff, bad stuff keeps happening, or my life isn't what I think it should be. And he says it's his good pleasure to do that. Why does he reveal stuff to us? It's his good pleasure. God is not sitting up in heaven just trying to... He, he doesn't have you on puppet strings just playing with you, putting you over you know, fire back and forth. He's not trying to screw with you. He's not trying to... If you're, if you're in here and you're like, I'm trying to follow God, but because of the way my parents treat me, or the way my friends treat me, or the, the way my life seems to be going, I don't see how he's in control at all. I don't see how he loves me at all. It, if that's kind of where you're at, God's not trying to just mess with you. He, it says that He gets pleasure out of you getting perspective. He gets pleasure out of you understanding the reason why you are in the situation you are. This is a lot similar to what we're talking about on Sundays, if you come in on Sunday with our Steadfast series. God doesn't. God wants you to get a perspective and know how to look at it the right way um, because he, he gets joy out of that because you're his, you're His kids. God, I think next week we're doing God as Father. Is that right? Maybe? It's not. That's okay. But God is our Father, and He's made us um, His children. He, he doesn't want us to just be kind of in limbo. What's going on, God? He doesn't want that for us. And uh, He goes on to kind of explain the plan. 
In verse 10, he says, this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and everything on earth. Now, the key word in there is at the right time. Not at your time, he'll bring everything under his authority. Not at my time, or, or, or another way you could write that or say that is, uh, in God's way, he will bring everything under his authority. Not in my way or the way that I think. So, so I might think, well, you know, God's timing is for this situation to end now. God's timing is for me to get to get out of this place now, get out of this house now, get out of the, this situation now, get out of this relationship now. That, that's what I think. But God doesn't say it's your time and what you want. He says it's the right time. And what he says is at that right time, it'll be under his authority. Everything in heaven and on earth. And that's a good thing. You want, you want everything under God's authority because like, think about what, I don't know what you, what you know or think about heaven, but in heaven, there's no sin, there's no hurt, there's no broken relationships, there's no betrayal, there's no feeling like you're, people are talking behind your back because everything's under Christ's authority there. And he's saying at the right time, he's going he's gonna to make that our lives. At the right time. And um, everything in heaven and earth. But the reality of that is that it's, it's God's time and not our time. And, and why is that a good thing? Like why, even as Christians, why is it good that it's not my timing on things? And, and I want you guys to, to really, in small groups tonight, you know, asking on your leaders some of these things because... Any of you that, that live long enough, and some of you guys have lived long enough so they're sitting in this room, you'll realize what you think is the right time for things or what you want, very shortly after later, ends up not being what you want. I mean, for, for me in high school, it was always like, I think God's timing was for me to, to date this girl at this time. And you date that girl or you date that boy, and you realize, oh, that's, I really thought that was God's way or God's time for me, and it is not. And, and you get out of that. You think, I want, you've all had, as, as kids, we've all had uh, things we wanted for Christmas that we, we got and we were like, for months, we are like, I can't wait till I get that. I can't wait till I get that new pair of shoes. I can't wait till I get that iPhone. I can't wait till I get whatever. And then six, seven months down the road, you're like, this isn't even that good. So the fact is, we as Christians and non-Christians, we don't really know what we want. And what we want changes. And the timing of what we think is, is good or or right changes. And that's from the fact that in the Bible, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, they, God kind of said, look, you, do it, you, can, you have the freedom to do it your way. And they chose to not do it God's way, to not do it in God's time. And it didn't work out for them. And if you think you're any different, look back at your life and think about times when you said, I really want this. And then later, you realize that's not what you want at all. We, we are no different than our spiritual and, and physical ancestors of Adam and Eve were no different in the fact that we would have chosen sin, we would have chosen our way, what we think is right over God. Um, but what's great about Jesus is verse 11, uh, or verse 10, he says, this is the plan at the right time, or, sorry, verse 11, he says, furthermore, because we're united with Christ, we have received this inheritance, for he chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to the plan. Well, what did God choose us in advance of? Anybody? Anybody know what that is? He chose us in advance of those bad decisions we would make. So the, re the reality that it's better for God being in control than me being in control of my life is, is really good because God knew all the bad decisions you would make. God knew all the bad things that would happen to you that aren't your fault. God knew the fact that, that you would... Um, Willingly and, and sometimes unwillingly because of sin in the world, because we live in a broken, messed up world, he knew that that was the case. And so he created a plan that included you in it before all those things happened. That has to do with the fact that God is real, that God is holy, as we've talked about the last few weeks in here. But he says that he, he does this and he does this, he, he has this plan to choose you in front so you can receive this inheritance. And as a child of God, you get an inheritance. If you don't know what an inheritance is, it's what's left for you um, as, a, as a member of a family. So your parents are going to leave you an inheritance, or, or they might leave you no inheritance. The inheritance they might leave you is, is just nothing. But God is your father if you're in Christ, and he leaves an inheritance. He, leave, he left Jesus an inheritance, and that's why all this is through Christ. That's why he says, because we're united in Christ, we've received this inheritance. And that inheritance is the fact that 
Not that you get out of those situations, but that you get the kingdom and you get God. And that's some spiritual language. You get the kingdom. What does that mean? Well, ultimately, one day it means you're going to get to go to heaven where everything's perfect and you're out of whatever crazy situation your life is in right now. But God has a bigger plan and God's, God's plan, the fact that God's in control, is affecting way more people than just you. Now, I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus had to receive his inheritance from the Lord. How did Jesus get his inheritance? Which was ultimately that inheritance, it's, it's the presence of God. It's sitting with God. It's not just stuff. It's getting to be with God who is perfect and holy and real and loves us and has perfect relationship with us. But the way Jesus got that was through the cross. The cross involved suffering, betrayal from friends, from family, a lot of the same stuff you're in right now. And, and, and Jesus understood and he had perspective on the fact that God was in control. He knew God was in control. That's why he could go through those things willingly. He, he could go through suffering. He could go through um, betrayal because he knew what the inheritance was. How do you think we as Christians are going to receive our inheritance? If, if we say if we want to be like Jesus, we want to grow like Jesus more. That's a, that's a scary thing because Jesus was a homeless guy that got betrayed and murdered. So do you want to be like Jesus in that regard? And now Jesus wasn't just a homeless guy who was betrayed and murdered. He's the son of God. And he knew what he was doing. He did it willfully. But he did that. He went through a bunch of crap because he knew what was on the other side of it. He knew God had a bigger plan. And him going through that was going to affect the whole world. Everyone sitting in this room. Him going through stuff was going to save someone down the road. And that's what God's doing in your situation right now. And the relationships that you're in and the abuse that you're in and or maybe it's just the craziness you're in. It, it's not solely about you, although God cares and loves and is working to, to bring all things under His authority as we read earlier, but He is doing something that's not just about you. And I want you to think about that tonight. What about my situation? If I go through it, if I trust Christ in this, could help somebody else down the road. God's plan, like Jesus, like God's plan for Jesus, was to die on the cross so that the whole world would be saved. A lot of what you guys are going through is so that you'll trust Christ, come out of it the other side, and then you can help others. That's what your leaders here do. They've been through a lot. They've struggled with sin. They've struggled with a lot of the same things you guys are struggling with. But finding faith and trust in Christ has brought them back because now they're trying to pour that into you guys, and that's what God wants to do in you. It really is. That's what he. That's what he wants to do. He. God being in control affects way more than, than just us. Right now, um, in Iran, or as we say in America, Iran, there is the fastest growing church in the world right now. Like People are coming to trust that God is in control like crazy. Right now, to be a believer in Iran, in Iran, <laughs> Iran, whatever you want to say, Iran, you can get killed for your faith. You have to go to church in hiding. You get out, you're an outcast in society if you do that. And in a place where, try to think about being a believer where if you came to Siggy tonight, you risked your life. I mean, I know some of you think you risked your life running through the rain over here. But you, they are literally risking their lives, but they're trusting in God because they know what their inheritance is. And, and, and we have the same faith in us that, that believers in around have, but there's this reality that you can trust in God even in the midst of the junk going on in your life. And God wants to bring you through what you're doing through faith in Him. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get better. Jesus had a rough go all the way through. The disciples, the people that followed Jesus and then shared their faith with everyone else, they had a really rough life. So I'm not saying following Jesus and knowing God's in control is going to lead to happiness and prosperity and, and just no, nothing bad's going to happen. In fact, the more you follow Jesus, the more likely something bad might happen. But if you know where your inheritance is, you're going to be able to walk through that and come out on the other side. One last thought, when I, was in, uh, when I was in college with my roommate Aaron, uh, threw him against the wall, all that stuff, the, the guy across that I mentioned, Marcos, when, when I left school, uh, we had done some Bible studies together, but he was still like, you know, I hate Christians, and this, we were at a Baptist school, a little tiny Christian Baptist school, and he was like, this is the worst place ever, and all of all, and, and, I, and I left thinking kind of the same thing, that was a waste of time, how was I following God there, and how is God in control of that? 
Well, about two years ago, which was, or about three years after I left that place, that dorm and transferred schools, I got a call from Marcos. Um, he lives in Dallas now, and, and he's following Jesus, and he told me that the way that I would treat my roommate was the first time he saw Christians not be just overly hypocritical and hateful to their roommate. He even gave me grace for the time I threw him against the wall. But Marcos now knows Jesus, is serving Jesus, is a part of a church, helping with youth. And, and the time in my life that I thought God was so out of control, and same thing from, from my two friends that died, a lot of people came to know Jesus because of their deaths, because they were Christians. In, in the times in my life when I felt like, God, you are not in control, as I lived a longer period of time, I got to see how God's plan in that was way bigger. He has a way bigger plan in your situation right now. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you are in control and not us. Um, God, I just pray for the students in here and in my heart that, that we would surrender control to you, that we would just quit trying to, to think we know best, to think that you know, you have some agenda against us that we're going through all this junk for nothing. I pray for the student here who feels like there's no hope and, and you're not in control of anything and you don't care about him or her and, and you have abandoned them. God, that they would see that you have a plan. That your word promises that everything will be under the authority of Christ. That everything will be made new, even their situation. God, I pray that you would do this in our hearts because we can't do it on our own. We can't just try harder to understand or read the Bible more, but we would just be dependent on praying and asking you to give us faith. Like we, pray, like we sang at the beginning of City, Lord, we need you. Oh, we need you. Let that be our, our prayer this week. In Jesus' name.